Part 1 You will hear a conversation between two women as one of the women buys a bus pass. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we begin. You should answer the questions as you listen as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning. I'm here to get a student bus pass, please. Of course, madam. Do you want to buy a month bus pass, a six-month bus pass or a year pass? Oh, just a month pass, please. Right then. I'll just have to take a few details. Yes, of course. First of all, what's your name? Natalie Jameson. And how do you spell Jameson? J-A-M-E-S-O-N. Thank you. And what's your address? 45 Forest Avenue, Newlands, Adelaide. Is that forest with one R or two R's? Just one. And what's the postcode, please? Oh, yes. It's 8490. Thanks. Now, what's your date of birth, if you don't mind me asking? Not at all. It's the 13th of May, 1982. I also need to know your telephone number here in Adelaide. OK. I just need to check that, as I only moved here last week. Now, where is it? Here we are. It's 6249-7152. Do you need a code or anything? Oh, no, that's OK, thank you. Can I see your university card, please? Yes, here it is. Good. That's fine. Now, for which zone do you need a pass? Well, I'm not sure. I was hoping you'd be able to help me, as I don't really know my way around here yet. As you know, I live in Newlands, and I have to get to the university campus in the centre of town every day. Well, the university is in Zone 1, and Newlands has two zones. The side nearer to the town centre is Zone 5, but the far side is Zone 6. What road is it that you live in again? Forest Avenue. Let's see on this map. There it is. The nearest bus stop is in Zone 5. That's lucky. Zones 1 to 6 are $15 more expensive. Great. Make the pass out for Zones 1 to 5 then, please. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. I've got some other questions too, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. Well, this weekend my friend and I aren't doing anything, so we thought we'd take a trip out of town and visit somewhere new. Does the bus service run any trips like that? Yes, we've got a selection of trips. I'll tell you about some of them. Thanks. Right, the first one goes up to McDonald Nature Park. The bus leaves at 8 o'clock and takes about two hours to get there and leaves for the return at 4.30 in the afternoon. Once there, you can walk around the nature trails. It's really nice and the McDonald River runs through there and that's really beautiful, so take a camera with you. Then there's the Pearl Bay trip. The bus leaves at 9am and goes up the coast to Pearl Bay. How far is that? It's an hour away. Once there, you can walk along the cliffs up to Rocky Point, which has a famous view up the coast. Or you can just lie on the beach and swim. Don't forget to take your swimming gear and a towel. The water's pretty safe there and there are always lifeguards. The bus arrives back in Adelaide at 5pm. Mmm, that sounds nice. What else? Well, there's the Huron Gold Mine. It's just a half-day trip, leaving here at 9.30am and arriving back at 2pm. It only takes half an hour to get there, which is good. It's an old worked-out mine that has changed into a sort of museum. 
They have all the old equipment and a guide takes you around some of the tunnels and shows you some of the techniques they used to use. You might even find some gold they missed. Yeah, I could do with that. It's pretty interesting, but the mines can be quite cold, so take a sweater. So how do those three sound? Quite interesting. I really like the idea of going up the coast and spending a day on the beach, but my friend Karen will like the idea of the nature park. I'd better wait and check out with her what she wants to do before booking. No problem at all. You just need to pop in sometime during the week and we'll make the booking. Thanks very much. You've been very helpful. No problem. See you later. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a radio presenter interviewing a man about the Sydney Harbour Bridge. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully to the interview and answer questions 11 to 16. Well, good morning again, everyone, and welcome to Perspective, the weekly New South Wales radio programme on subjects of general interest from our local area. Today I have in the studio Mr George Simmons. Good morning, George. Good morning, Anne. So what are you going to talk to us about today, George? Well, for people from New South Wales, and particularly Sydney, this will be of great interest, I hope. I'm going to tell you a little about Sydney Harbour Bridge. Wow, that would be so interesting. I think so. To start with, I'd like to tell you a little about the size of the bridge. The arch span is 503 metres, and the weight of the steel arch is 39,000 tonnes. The summit is 134 metres above mean sea level, though it can actually increase by as much as 18 centimetres on hot days, as the result of steel expanding in heat. The two pairs of pylons at each end are about 89 metres high, and are made of concrete and granite. The steel used for the bridge was largely imported. About 79% came from the United Kingdom, but the rest was Australian made. The granite was quarried in Moria down the coast, and the concrete is also Australian. So most of the steel used to make our great bridge actually came from England? Yes, I'm afraid so. However, the workforce were all Aussie. Thank God for that. When was the bridge actually built? The bridge was opened in 1932, but work first began in 1924, with the construction of the bridge approaches and spans, with two separate teams building the arch on each side, working towards each other. The arch was successfully joined on August the 19th, 1930. I'm afraid that working practices weren't very fair in those days, and the local government demolished 438 homes, which were in the way of the approaches, and as many as 800 families living there were displaced without compensation. The standards of industrial safety were inadequate too. Sixteen workers died during its construction, mainly from falling off the bridge. I didn't realise that. Yes. The bridge was formally opened on the 19th of March 1932 by the Premier of New South Wales, Mr Jack Lang. When it was opened, it was the longest single-span steel arch bridge in the world and it was one of the greatest engineering masterpieces of its time. Several songs were also composed in advance for the occasion, but these have now largely been lost or forgotten. However, three postage stamps were issued to commemorate the opening of the bridge and these still exist. One of these stamps, with a face value of five shillings, is now worth several hundred dollars today. You now have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 17 to 20. So that's the history of the bridge. 
Is the bridge still the same today as when it was built? No, it's quite different. The basic structure is the same, of course. Originally, the bridge was constructed to carry a road, two sets of tram lines and railways. In 1957, the two tram lines were removed when Sydney abolished its trams, thus giving the bridge two more traffic lanes. Today it carries eight traffic lanes, two railroad lanes and a footpath along its eastern side. One of the eastern traffic lanes is now a dedicated bus lane. The bridge is often crowded and in 1992 the harbour tunnel was opened to help carry the traffic load. More than 160,000 vehicles cross the bridge each day. Before the harbour tunnel was opened this figure was as high as 182,000 and would be much higher today if it were not for the tunnel. Pedestrians, horses and push bikes are not allowed on the bridge anymore. Wow, the bridge actually carries that much? Oh yes. Actually, before the harbour bridge opened, it was completely packed with railway carriages, trams and buses to stress test its load-bearing capacity. While it has had many traffic jams since, and half a million people walked across it on its 50th anniversary, it has probably never been asked to carry that much of a load since. Amazing, and I suppose the toll for crossing the bridge has changed a bit too. I'm afraid so. The initial toll charged for a car was six pence, while a horse and rider were charged three pence. Today the toll costs three dollars, but is only charged when travelling to the south as an efficiency measure to speed up traffic flow. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear three students discussing a survey they are going to do. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hi Mel, hi Laura, sorry I'm a bit late. I got held up by the bus, it just didn't come for ages. Don't worry, you're only a couple of minutes behind and we've only just been chatting. Right then, we're here to organise the survey that we're going to do. Mel, you said that you discussed with Professor Donald Walker what type of survey we were going to do. Yes, I spoke to Professor Walker two days ago and I told him that the surveys we were considering were a telephone survey, a street survey and a mail survey. He thought that the phone one would be too expensive for us and the postal one would take too long, so we decided we should do the street one. I think that's right. If we do the street one, then we can get the whole thing done in one day and we can get on with analysing the results. Yes, that's right. Now there are some other things that Professor Walker wanted to know about. How big should the survey be? Well, the ideal figure for a survey such as this should be about a thousand people, but that will take us about a month to get that many people and we just don't have that much time. On the other hand, if we just choose a hundred people, the survey won't be statistically significant. So what about something in the middle? What about 600? Still too many. That'll take us ages. 400? Let's split the difference and say 500. Okay. okay. And how many questions? If there are too many, we'll just have the same problem. Professor Walker said we should have no more than ten or people get bored. Ten, then? I think even fewer. Eight. I think three fewer again to make sure we can get the numbers done quickly. OK, I agree with that. I'm not sure, but I suppose so. You now have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion 
and answer questions 28 to 30. Now, Professor Walker asked where we were going to do the survey. Does he want to avoid that area then? Probably. Now, we can either all stay together or split up and do different locations. Well, if we split up, then I think we've got a better chance of getting more people surveyed. Yes, I agree with Laura. OK. Now, I made a list of the possible locations in Westley where we could station ourselves. There's the town square, at the entrance to the train station, at the university cafeteria, outside Dobbins department store, on the corner of the High Street and College Road, the bus station and the corner of High Street and Wilkins Road. What do you think? I think the square is great, but the people at the train station will be travelling and often in a hurry. I agree with all of that, and I think the bus station will have the same problem as the train station. OK, that's those two out then. I think the other ones in town were good too. The cafeteria will have too many students and that will create too great a bias to our survey. We need a good cross-section of the population and anywhere too close to the university won't give us that. Laura's right. So, out of the other town ones, I think that the two on the high street corners are good. I don't agree. The high street corner with College Road would be good, but the corner with Wilkins Road is too far out. Not enough people will come by there. Yes, Mel's right there. We should use Dobbins Department Store instead. I can see your point. OK, that's settled then. All three of us will be stationed in town then, but not the Wilkins Road position. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a further education marine biology lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning everyone and welcome to this further education lecture on marine biology. Today we're going to look at the coelacanth. The discovery of the coelacanth has been compared to finding a dinosaur walking around today over 85 million years after it went extinct. The story began a few days before Christmas in 1938, when the first living coelacanth was discovered off the east coast of South Africa, at the mouth of the Chalumna River. The fish was caught in a shark gill net by Captain Goosen and his crew, who, recognising the bizarre nature of their catch, alerted the local museum in the small South African town of East London. The director of the East London Museum at the time was Miss Marjorie Courtney Latimer, after whom the coelacanth was eventually named. Miss Courtney Latimer offered bounties to fishermen for unfamiliar fish. It was Miss Courtney Latimer who alerted the prominent South African ichthyologist, Dr. J. L. B. Smith, who initially identified the fish, and subsequently informed the world about this amazing discovery. This first coelacanth led to the discovery of the first documented population, off the remote Comoros Islands between the mainland of Africa and Madagascar. For 60 years, this was presumed to be the only coelacanth population in existence. Originally, it was a concern that the coelacanth might have a very limited range and that overfishing along the Comoros Islands might wipe it out. However, scientists were amazed when, on July the 30th, 1998, an American scientist discovered a coelacanth population in Indonesia. Dr. Mark Erdman was on a honeymoon trip to the area investigating a coral reef research site.
when he spotted a strange fish being wheeled into the fish market. He recognized the fish as a coelacanth and snapped a picture before it was sold. Dr. Erdman's subsequent research revealed that the people from Sulawesi had a name for it, Raja, King of the Sea. The Sulawesi coelacanth colony is about 10,000 kilometers east of where the coelacanths were previously known to occur in the Western Indian Ocean. Both Sulawesi and Comoros coelacanths are quite different from all other living fish. But perhaps the most interesting feature of the coelacanth is that it has paired lobed fins, which move in a similar fashion to our arms and legs. Coelacanths also have an extra lobe on their tail and a vertebral column that is not fully developed. They are the only living animal to have a fully functional intracranial joint, a division that separates the ear and brain from the nasal organs and eye, and allows the front part of the head to be lifted when the fish is feeding. The brown Sulawesi coelacanth and the steel blue Comoros coelacanth share these unusual characteristics. The discovery of the coelacanth in 1938 is still considered to be the zoological find of the century. This living fossil comes from a lineage of fish that was thought to have been extinct since the time of the dinosaurs. Coelacanths are known from the fossil record dating back over 360 million years and peaked in abundance about 240 million years ago. Before 1938, they were believed to have become extinct approximately 80 million years ago, after mysteriously disappearing from the fossil record. How could the coelacanth disappear for over 80 million years and then turn up alive and well in the 20th century? The answer seems to be that fossil coelacanths appeared to live in environments with clay sedimentation with plenty of volcanic activity. Modern coelacanths, both in the Comoros and Sulawesi, inhabit caves and overhangs in vertical marine reefs at about 200 metres, environments not conducive to fossil creation. In 1991, scientists got a better understanding of the fish when the Comoros got their independence from France and French restrictions on research were lifted. This allowed scientists to study the fish off the Comoros Islands. As the animal hides in underwater caves some 300 to 700 feet down during the day and comes out at night to feed, diving is not an option, and previously only fishermen specimens had been available for study. But this time the scientists had their own submarine so they could study the coelacanth in its natural habitat through portholes. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.